good morning to everybody. Um, as Jan pointed out, the schedule I intend to follow is to go through a mini lecture first to give you just a taste of uh, you know what coming here would mean in terms of your of the courses you'll attend. In fact, what I'm going to talk about is a small part of a real lecture in uh, econo in the course of economic analysis, which is a core module in uh, in the first semester. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just. Uh, start. Uh, okay, so the, um, as you can see, the title is uh, made for purpose, uh, because it's, as I said, as I said, it's just a, a little uh, taste of what uh, you might be doing next year when you join Southampton. This is, um, just to give you the, 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 the end of the talk, this is a story about a wrong business decision, very poor business decision taken by a big corporation, um, and we look at it from uh, the lenses of game theory, which is one of the main tools in economics. So we use this as an example to see how uh, theory can actually be helpful in taking good decisions in, in markets. Um, so game theory, I believe most of you have been exposed to game theory, but just to give you a taste and an overview, uh, you might have come across a movie. A little bit of this movie is also shown in one in another lecture. This is A Beautiful Mind, it's about John Nash, as you know, this is a pioneer of game theory. Um, but of course, he's not the only, the only person. One of the precursors of game theory was actually John von, no von Neumann. And as you can see in the picture there, there's also, is also he was also the co-inventor of the computer operating system. And that little thing that you see in the picture is actually the first computer. And it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's on display in uh, uh, the, one of the libraries at Har Harvard University. Uh, now, of course, this is history, but more recently, if you wish, one of the most uh, well-known game theory was Paul Milgram. And uh, the reason why it's so well known is not only that he was really an amazingly good academic, he is an amazingly good academic, but also because the uh, results of his theories were used in designing the auction for the spectrum of uh, TV uh, frequency, uh, sorry, telephone frequencies. And that was actually the application of a theoretical paper that led to the highest revenue for the government um, over the last decade. So it's fairly, fairly uh, well known for that. But of course, game theory is used in uh, any business company, so it's, it's broadly applied. Uh, <clears throat> now, what is a game? Of course, I won't have the time to give you, you know, a full taste of game theory, but a game is played whenever people interact. So driving a car in a busy city is a game. Why is it a game? because the return to the way you drive depends on how good a driver you are, as well as on how good other drivers are. So the returns to an action that you take do not only depend on what you do, but also depend on what other, other players do. So there is an in, a, a fundamental interdependence in um, what you get, and hence taking um, considering what opponents do is, is very, very important. This is the case when you bid at an auction. Whether you get the object or not depends not only on the offer that you make, but also on the offers that your opponents make. Because typically in an auction, you win the object, even only if the offer you make is higher than what uh, uh, your opponents bid. But pricing in a supermarket is a game because you compete in a small market, say in an oligopoly, also negotiating your salary is a game because that is a bargaining game. So all these situations have in common the fact that the payoff display an amount of interdependence. So what happens to you depends essentially on what others do as well as on your own choice. Uh, this is a very informal uh, introduction, but of course game theory is a method to analyze rational behavior in all this type of situation. And in order to be, to do so in a smart way, what you need to do is somehow to outguess what your comp competitor is going to do. And in addition to that, obviously you need to consider the implication of your actions. And some of these actions may have implications that linger through the future. 
And all these aspects are important in taking decisions. So what I'm going to uh, go through now, it's just a very simple application of, of this. Um, and you will see when we go through this little mini lecture that this is a theoretical lecture. So we will look at a set of uh, assumptions and we'll focus on some details that are relevant and ignore others that are less relevant. Uh, and we will look at a model in a very consistent way, logical way, and this is uh, the scientific aspect of game theory. Um, now, a key assumption we take is that, uh, as we will uh, typically any course in economics spend a great amount of time on, is to explain the way in which we model behavior in terms of rational behavior of individuals. Um, this is all as far as the theory is concerned. Let's look at this little uh, story and try to get something out of the little story. So the little story is the following. Um, now presumably when this movie came out, uh, you were probably not bored <laughs> or, or very, very young. Uh, but it's a very nice movie that uh, uh, I strongly recommend you to watch. It's widely available. And we will focus on one specific bit of the movie. Now, this is a movie about E.T. E.T. is an extraterrestrial. Um, and he becomes friends with a boy called Elliot. And Elliot, in order to make friends with the E.T., the extraterrestrial, in a bit of the movie that you can see in the link that I put here, but I don't have the time to show you, um, in, in this little bit of the movie, um, Elliot scatters bits of chocolate, in fact, um, in order to become befriend uh, this little ET extraterrestrial. Now, the point of showing you this, or talking about this, is that in the movie there's some clear form of advertisement because you see exactly the brand of uh, uh, the product that Elliot uses in this part of the movie. And in the movie, you see that um, E.T. is befriended by some little peanut butter candy, the brand of which is Hershey. Um, now, because the movie became incredibly popular, um, Hershey benefit, extent, benefited extensively from the advertisement of this company, of this movie. So what happened was that in the market for candy products, uh, Mars was the biggest player at the time, but as a result of the advertisement of this movie, Hershey's market share shot up, and Hershey reached more or less the volume of business of Mars, which was a, a, significant, uh, a significant achievement. Um, so the story, the bit of the story that we want to use is uh, the fact that Mars, in fact, was the first brand to be offered um, the possibility of advertising M&M &M in, um, in the movie. But Mars politely refused this offer. Um, the producer of the movie offered this possibility to Mars for one million, um, one million, I think that was a price. And obviously, uh, Mars made its computation, decided that it was not worth it. Um, now, it turned out that uh, the movie was a significant success at the time. And maybe this was partly unexpected because if you think about it, this was a movie about a uh, horrible looking extraterrestrial uh, creature. Um, so it was, it came a bit of a, as a surprise that the movie became so popular. So probably Mars misunderstood the, the future or I don't know, it, it's not clear what led to this decision. What is clear, however, is that uh, Mars' decision not to feature Eminem in the movie uh, became, in history, one of the most famous uh, examples of the wrong business decision being taken. And you can read more uh, in the link at the bottom of this page in case you're interested. Um, okay, so uh, what does game theory have to do with uh, ET and with chocolate? Uh, this is the story. So the story is, uh, as I told you, that the producer of the movie um, had an, as an original plan to use a tray for, uh, of Mars M&Ms. 
However, Mars turned down this offer, presumably because it thought that the one million was a very high price to pay to have the product featured in the in the movie. The producer then turned to Hershey. Hershey accepted the deal, and the rest is history. Um, so let's try and uh, read this little event with the eyes of game theory. Um, so I give you three uh, examples, and they will all be based on uh, uh, some uh, data. But data are actually uh, an example here. I lose my mouse. My mouse. Who has control of my mouse? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, keep let's keep uh, the data here, as we forget. So the cost. Oops. Bear with me. So the cost. The cost. Uh, get a little bit here so the cost okay of this advertisement plan to be paid to the producer of the movie was 1000 just for the sake of the example uh, now what about the benefits my handwriting is poor but please bear with me so the benefits of uh, uh, this advertisement to mars let's assume that they would have been something like 800k um if uh, mars accepted but if mars did not accept and hershey instead accepted this obviously would have damaged mars so let's assume that the damage could be quantified as uh, 500k um now as far as hershey is concerned we are marcian so we don't know about uh, hershey that much but we know that the benefit to hershey for the sake of the example uh, could take one of two values either 1200 say with probability a half or 700 with probability a half. Now we don't know, but we are Mars. Put yourself in the shoes of Mars. We don't know Mars about, uh, we don't know much about Hershey and you know, firms are very, um, very little keen to share information about benefits and costs. So this is the best guess that Mars can have about the benefit to Hershey of accepting the 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 plan uh okay so as i said these numbers are just um pure um just for the sake of the example that is not a quantitative study rather it's a theoretical example here uh so let's see how we can model this first thing this is really naive so this is mars having to take a decision and what uh, Mars can think is, okay, if uh, I say no to the producer, nothing happens, so the, uh, my payoff is zero, that's the lower part of this branch. If I say yes to the producer, oh well, I get 800K benefit, but I have to pay 1 million. So my net benefit is actually minus 200K. So this is what the number you see in the upper part of this tree. So this is a naive approach for many reasons. Um, it's a naive approach because it ignores the fact that Mars is not the only producer in this market. There are other competitors that may take up this offer. Uh, but if Mars had to choose on the basis of this analysis, then obviously what Mars would have chosen is to say no because not winning anything is better than losing 200k and hence the outcome of this decision would have been that Mars should have said no to the offer as it in fact did in uh, um, in reality now this is very naive i said this is really really naive no person who has done a minimum rudimental course in game theory would have come up with this uh, with this type of modeling because it's uh, it's too simplistic it fails to capture capture very many things so let's go one step further maybe you know people who were backing this decision who were advising uh, in this occasion had done some game theory so they had done some undergraduate game theory and they knew obviously that in a game what matters to payoffs are also the action taken by the opponent. Uh, so, so let's look at this formalization. So this is again, it's a decision tree. First, Mars can say yes to the producer or no. 
And then following the decision of Mars, if Mars declines the offer, then the offer goes to Hershey. And Hershey can say either yes to the producer or no. Now let's work out these payoffs here. If uh, the, oops, sorry. Um, if uh, Hershey says no and Mars says no, then payoffs are renormalized to zero, nothing happens. So that's a zero, zero in the lower part of the decision tree. Um, if uh, Mars says no and Hershey accepts the offer, let's work out what are the payoffs to the two players. So the first number between the square bracket is the payoff to Mars. Now we said up here that uh, the um, that uh, having Hershey in the movie would have entailed a cost to Mars of 500. So this is the minus 500k here. Now the second number is the payoff to Hershey. Now how do we compute the payoff to Hershey? Now, we don't know exactly what the benefit to Hershey is going to be, but we have formulated some expectations. And our best guess is that the benefit is 1,200 with probability half or 700 with probability half. Now, if you take the expected value of B, that expected value is 950. So 950 would be the 1,200 times a half plus 700 times a half. This is the expected benefit to Hershey from saying yes. Now, since uh, Hershey would have to pay a thousand to the producer, then the net benefit to Hershey of accepting the offer of the producer is minus 50. That would be the 950 minus 1000. Yep. So that's where that's where the minus 50 comes from. Um, now, what if Mars says yes? Well, if Mars says uh, yes, then Mars gains 800, as stated here. It pays 1,000, so the net benefit to Mars is 200. So this is the, so the, so sorry, the net cost to Mars is 200, and this explains this minus 200K here. Now, Hershey is not involved, so the payoff is zero. So as you have noticed, the way I've done this is I set up a decision tree that shows you the timeline of the decision. And then at the terminal nodes of this decision tree, I have put the numbers which are the payoffs. And I have computed that on those on the basis of the model. So once I have the extensive form and the final uh, uh, payoffs, then what I can do is to work out by backward induction, starting from the end, what is the, the optimal decision. Let's try and do so. So let's start from Hershey. Now, Hershey gets the, the possibility to feature the product in the movie. Now, Hershey can say either yes or no. If it says yes, it loses 50K. If it says no, it loses zero. So the optimal thing to do for Hershey there is to say no. Now let's go backward. Now it's Mars choice. Mars knows that if Mars rejects the offer, then the offer goes to Hershey, and Hershey would find it optimal to say no in this setup. Uh, if Mar Mars says yes, the payoff to Mars is minus 200. If Mars says no, the payoff to Mars is zero. Since zero is better than minus 200, then the best thing to do for uh, Mars is to say no. So according to this formalization, the best uh, choice for Mars uh, should have been the one taken. So Mars should say no, and this is probably, probably, this is what happened, yeah? So this is uh, what motivated the decision that Mars in reality took. Now, the point of this example is that for me to show you that this approach is very simplistic because it fails to consider the importance of information in this setup. In particular, here, the, the relevant, gosh, this mouse does strange thing. Um, the correct game theory approach to this decision involves taking into account that the benefit that Hershey gets from featuring the product in the movie is not known to Mars, but is known to Hershey. Hershey does observe its benefit. 
and does observe whether the benefit is 1.2 million or if it is 700k. This is not observable by Mars, but it's indeed observable by Hershey. And this matters a lot because if we consider the full um, setup, the correct uh, game theory approach to this situation, which is the one I'm going to describe you in a second, then we'll see that the, the conclusion is somewhat surprising. So here, what is the difference between what we had before? The difference is that here there's an additional step. This is N. N is another player, is a special player, is nature. Now, nature is a player that decides uncertainty. So nature here, um, split life into two possible branches. One is when the benefit to Hershey is 1.2 million, and one is when the benefit to Hershey is only 700K. And Hershey observes the revenue. So by formalizing things in this way, we distinguish the fact that one mouse doesn't know the benefit to Hershey, Hershey actually does. So now here payoffs as well. Now this, the lower part of this branch, this is Hershey choosing. Hershey now knows that the benefit is kind of modest, it's only 700K. So if Hershey says yes, then the benefit is 700, but the cost to the producer is, is a, a thousand, remember. So the net benefit is a loss of 300 here. Um, so what is the optimal choice for Hershey at this lower branch? The optimal choice for Hershey is actually to say no, because the benefit is actually relatively modest. So it doesn't pay to accept the offer of the producer. Things are very different in the upper part of the tree, because if the benefit is actually 1.2 million, which turned out to be the case because the movie was very successful, then in that contingency, the benefit to Hershey from featuring the product in the movie is 1.2 million minus 1 million, which is the cost. So there, that is a net profit of 200. So clearly the best thing to do for Hershey there is to say yes to the movie. Yeah. So these are the optimal decisions of Hershey. Now remember, we are Mars. So what we care are, is our payoff. So let's work out what is our payoff on the upper part of that tree, that is minus 500K. What is the, uh, our payoff in the lower part of the tree, that is zero, because Hershey finds it optimal to reject the offer, to decline uh, the offer. So ex ante, if we move back in expected terms, our payoff is actually minus 500K if we fall in the upper part of that tree, and zero if we fall in the lower part of the tree. So in expected terms, our payoff is minus 250. Now, if instead we, ac we Mars, accept the offer, then we move along the upper part of the uh, initial node, and that gives you a loss of 200. So what is the optimal choice? At the root of the tree, our choice is between saying yes and losing 200, or saying no and losing 250. And you know, we're talking about losses here, but losing 200 is a lot better than losing 250. So the best thing to do for Mars in this specification is actually to say yes. Now you notice that the implications of this simple example are very different. The difference in all this stems from the fact that we correctly specify the story, the model, the situation the information framework, the timeline of the choices, all these details are very, very important. Now, in, uh, these are very important in economics, they're extremely important in finance as well. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you a simple example of, uh, you know, what is the moral of this story, if you wish. Um, theoretical methods do not give you answer, but that all in all work in all situations, but they give you a method to approach decisions in markets and in financial markets in particular. Uh, the answer obviously depends on subtle details of the situation. So uh, the core modules of a program typically teach you to appreciate the subtle de details of the situation. Uh, theory is very useful to gain insights and you apply to very, potentially very complex situations. Uh, but obviously, you know, a word of caveat here, two quotations that uh, I like, uh, you need to be careful in doing this. It's, uh, 
these are tools that need to be used appropriately.